Dr. Jose V. for a round of applause, Dr. Bay. Pimenta Bay. One more time, a warm round of applause for Dr. Jose V. Pimenta Bay. I want to thank you all very much for coming out and giving me an opportunity to share what I hope is, is relevant and useful information. I, of course, begin by saying in my initial tradition, Islam, I also say Imhotep and in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum. As I stood in the back listening to the brother talking about the situation that we face now and how the, the affairs, not only of this country, but the affairs of the world seem to be changing. And we have to essentially become more aware of what exactly is happening and where we should be going. I came in from West Virginia, and this past Saturday in West Virginia, there was a cross burning which had never taken place in Morgantown, West Virginia, as strange as it may sound, it's a little, little town with coal mines and a university. It had never taken place before. And this cross was burned on the lawn of an African-American couple who had never done anything to anybody in the quote-unquote white or European community. And all of a sudden people were all upset and they came together and said, you know, we need to do something about this. And then people found out that this family had been being harassed for years. The mayor of the town is African-American. And she became mayor about three years ago, and the, the purpose behind it was essentially to try to heal these wounds which other people always knew about. But evidently, white supremacist groups have decided, and I'm using their term, white supremacist groups, have been infiltrating this area for years. And in fact, many of them are moving out of the Ku Klux Klan and into more violent organizations, smaller units. So as I took all this in and said, well, you know, here I am in Morgantown. I didn't expect, of course, to, uh, you know, avoid racism. I'd be a jackass if I thought I could avoid racism living in the United States. But I did understand that it wasn't so bad, but that things were changing. Well, I then go back to the history department, and I hear someone talking about a graduate student in the history department, Confella, who was teaching some of his students that, to use his terms again, blacks, and this is interesting, Slavic peoples are inherently inferior because they are not homo sapiens. Now, I started to ask myself now, who does this sound like? If, if you know a little bit about the history of Germany, the rise of the Nazi party and so forth, the Germans created this fallacious notion of, of racial supremacy, defining themselves as Aryans, when in fact the Aryans are Iranians, but they leave that, they left that out. They're really talking about Nordic peoples and they talked about the Germans. But they developed this to justify their going into the Slavic countries of Eastern Europe in order to take over. Now, I thought that was interesting because usually, you know, people just kind of beat up on uh, quote unquote black folks. But this young man said Slavic peoples too. So I'm saying this, this is really getting interesting out here in terms of how the structure is, is changing. But then I also started to think to myself, I wonder how much this idiot knows about his own history. Because for me, my rationale for deciding to the Moorish legacy and Moorish history was because 
I always felt that the best way to silence most Europeans, so-called white folks, was to hit them in the bloodline. And what I mean by that is, if you begin to spend any time studying your own history, I'm speaking now to a European, spend, your, spend any time studying your own Irish history, your own Scottish history, your own English history, your own Spanish history, your own Italian history, Calabria, anything in Europe, any culture in Europe can be traced to peoples outside of Europe. And one of the greatest influences not only in blood but in culture in the sciences one of the greatest influences are coming from people known by Europeans as the Moors what I'd like to do now if I can is to get the slides I brought some slides up and I'll start in on the formal presentation some of my experiences and even doing the research on the Moors. Coming down here, I was talking to the, the brother, I forget a brother's name, hopefully he'll forgive me. Um, well, actually, we were trying to look, find each other for about 45 minutes. But I was telling him that when you know essentially the legacy of the Moors, the legacy of African people as it relates to European uh, history, European culture, a lot of Europeans will back off. In fact, most Europeans who are educated will back off. They'll even concede, essentially, you know, who, or say, say like, like, you know, we often say, say, you the man, you know, I, I, I can't say nothing to you because you, you woke up, obviously, because you, you essentially, you know, telling them things that, well, now you're telling me more than I want to know. On the plane coming in, I sat next to this European fellow who was asking me what, you know, what I did and so forth, and I told him, but then I started to uh, continue to talk. And then I went on and on. He said, the Moors, I don't know too much about the, thank you, brother, too, too much about the Moors. I, just that they were, uh, uh, well, they were Muslims, right? I said, well, yeah, well, you know, the vast majority of them were Muslims, but they were also people of other uh, faiths. And uh, he says, well, that's interesting. I said, but you know, the Moors are also in Ireland. And then he started to kind of move around <laughs> in the seat because he had also equated the Moors with Spain and Spain only. So I said, no, actually the, the Moors went up into Ireland and County Cork, in fact, I said and there were even uh, continued attacks on the coast by Moorish Corsairs as late as the 16th century. And a lot of these people into those Irishmen living in Ireland. I said, and you know, when you look at names like Moor, which is pretty obvious, you see it. Or Scottish or Irish names that have the MC on the front, whether it's Mick or Mac. That's a reference to the Moors. So MacDougall and, and MacConnell and McMarion and McMurray, etc. There's a reference to an African progenitor there. So the first slide I have up here is uh, from Alfonso the Tenth also known as El Sabio, or the wise one. He was a Catholic monarch, 13th century, who after about 500 years of a Moorish presence, and let me just say who the Moors were. The Moors invaded the Iberian Peninsula, and let me be specific, the Islamic era Moors, because there were Moors before there was the religion called Islam. But the Islamic era Moors invaded the Iberian Peninsula in 711 of the Common Era. And they proceeded to transform the very nature of the environment. The Moors brought with them a postal system. The Moors brought with them an educational structure, which essentially is what the, the contemporary university is modeled after the teaching of secular and secular as well as uh, holy or religious knowledge.
the Moors brought with them their skills in, in metalwork, their skills in medical surgery and pharmacology. The Moors brought with them their skills in, in horsemanship. All these things which would later become part of Spain. All these things which would prepare Spain for leading the European world, unfortunately, in taking over so much of the world because they were using the resources that the Moors had, had given them. But the Moors invade from northwest Africa and Alfonso X is one of the Catholic monarchs who recognizes that if we as Catholics, I'm talking now as Alfonso X, if we as Catholics are going to be able to deal with this Moorish presence, we have to study their stuff. We got to understand their sciences because we're losing people. There were people complaining as early as the 10th century about these uh, uh, so-called good Catholics no longer being able to speak Latin or even know anything about you know, Catholic liturgy. They're all going over to the Moorish camp. And the reason is because the Moors are the ones as the doctors who are actually engaging in some knowledgeable techniques in surgery and medicine. So, you know, what's the choice? You know, somebody tells you, see, I'm sick. One person says, well, you know, let me see. Uh, it could be that you have a blockage in an artery or something. Where is it? What you talking about? Blockage in an artery. Somebody told me up there it was because they're evil spirits. I need to go and pray or say 12 Hail Marys. Which, of course, doesn't hurt if you're a Catholic, but it also makes some sense to go and get some real medical knowledge, uh, medical skill, medical help. And this was the problem. So they started losing people. Alfonso X then commissioned the translation of several Moorish texts, medical texts, mathematical texts, philosophical texts, religious texts, had them translated from uh, Arabic into the developing Spanish vernacular, meaning the Spanish language, as well as Latin and French and had these books then distributed throughout the Catholic world. He was trying to bring the Catholic world, the Christian world of Europe, up to snuff with what the African Muslims had achieved. This is one of the pages from the chess book. Now I note this. People customarily are confused about the Moors in terms of the ethnicity. Many European histories treat the Moors as if they were Arabs who came directly out of the Arabian Peninsula. And we know that that isn't true. While it may be true that there are Arabs who have Moorish ancestry, or Moors who have Arab ancestry, an Arab and a Moor are not synonymous. This particular page from El Sabio's chess book shows people sitting playing chess. Those are Moors. As a turban, which appears to look like it should be uh, Arab in origin, doesn't make them an Arab. Any more than me wearing a French suit makes me a Frenchman. So we need to understand that when you look at something, you need to look beyond just the, the physical image and ask yourself, well, what was the history behind that era in order to understand it? This is one of the emperors of Morocco. This is uh, Ishmael, 16, uh, 1670. One of the emperors of Morocco who was known to have owned several Europeans as slaves. Now, a lot of people who are part of the African community or the African American community are often made to feel somewhat inferior because people say, well, you know, all you all ever did was descend from some slaves. And of course, you can believe that me being in West Virginia, I've had a lot of students, a lot of European American students, who come in the classes, you know, expecting to hear about the history of African American enslavement and the history of European Americans being the masters. And of course, I come from another direction. I begin at the beginning. And I deal with the issue of even where the word slave came from. And then we go back to that Slavic thing again, right? Yeah. See, remember homeboy earlier talking about you know, uh, the Slavic peoples being less than homo sapien. Well, yeah, some of the Germanic peoples thought so. It pressed them into servitude so much that their name became synonymous with servitude. Hence, slave. 
So when we look at the situation in its entirety, we recognize that no one has a monopoly on being enslaved. The only thing is, in recent, more recent history, African peoples were the most recently enslaved en masse. But when you have a long memory, you can remember something different and eliminate that notion of never having made any significant contribution to anything, always being a slave. Because when one thinks that they descend from slaves and that's their focus, they continue to act like slaves. Well, this is uh, backwards, but what that says is more. And it says it's from a collection of the Lehigh County Historical Society. You have Moors in the coats of arms. Okay, I'll just explain where that, that is from. Moors in the coats of arms of European families. And here's what's significant. When you consider that the European world today tries to hide as much as possible about their African links, their connection to African people, it is nothing short of profound when you go and look at heraldic texts, texts which show the coats of arms, the symbols of European families, and in it you find you. It's obvious that they're saying there was a time when we wanted to show you off as part of the family. We wanted to show you off so much that we put it in books which would be passed down for posterity. We have coats of arms hanging up in our homes showing you, African man and African woman, Asiatic. They're letting you know the way things used to be. They're not afraid to say it. Morrison, son of a Moor, Morris. In fact, I just say I, a dear friend of mine passed away yesterday morning. His name was Lewis John Morris, also known as Skyman. He was, he was given that name essentially because he was, was working, building bridges between African Americans and Native Americans. And the Lakota people gave him the name Skyman. He passed away yesterday. So I said that I would dedicate the, this lecture to him. But to find this legacy within European family coats of arms tells us that they obviously felt differently about us at some point. Otherwise, they wouldn't talk about us in a positive way. They wouldn't have us in the coats of arms. Now, what's intriguing is this. When I first started doing the research on the Moors, and I was looking at the presence of the Moors in European coats of arms, I found that the Moors, the term Moors, was always noted in the description of European books published in Europe. But when the books were reprinted in the United States, they changed the term to Negro. So you would look up, you know, the Morrison coat of arms, and instead of seeing, you know, a Morris head, you know, reefed about the temples, you would see a Negro's head wreathed about the temples. Now that may not seem like a whole lot unless you understand the meaning of the word Negro and unless you understand why these people were actually doing that. They were trying to disconnect the Moors from European history. But again, the, the phonetic sound of Moor was still there. It keeps coming up. Morrison, Moreau, Moore, Mordaunt, Morley, Morgan, and then some other names like Stuart and Halliburton and Gleam, and Brokas, Zamoras, all these names, even Zangermeister, or Singmaster, and I heard someone else say Douglas, which is Celtic for behold the Moor, or behold the black-skinned man. This is more, it's okay, you don't have to turn Turn that around. I, I, you know. Basically, this is another armorial bearing coming from the. I, you know. Basically, this is another armorial bearing coming from the an English family more. 
And this is from Fox Davies, The Art of Heraldry. Oh, that one needs to be turned around. <laughs> that one's uh, upside down. Uh, nature knows no color line. And he helps us really to understand, too, how once these coats of arms made their way into the European American community, the change in the term to Negro is given. Now, look at the names, if I read off the names. Maurice, Mormon, 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 Morcant, Moore, Mortison, Moreau, Morel, Morelli, right? All these Moors, just more, 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 right? But then when you look at the bottom and look at the top, Negroes in coats of arms of noble families, French, Dutch, and Belgian families with names of Negro. Now, it is possible, it is possible, Rogers did that when he put it in. But given, the, in, in order to explain to people in the 1950s who the people were, to say, you know, because at that time they were calling themselves Negroes. So you were Negro, so this more, you respond to Negro, you won't respond to more. That's what people, you know, that's what most people were in the 1950s. So that's possible. But I'm here to tell you that it's also true that people would change the term. European American publishers would change the term. These are additional coats of arms from coats of arms showing moors. There's one more there coming up out of a crown. Stuart, another Moorish sister wearing a crown. Uh, Brokus, a sister with bat wings coming out of her head. So which seems to suggest, I spoke to a, a colleague about that in terms of medieval symbol, seems to suggest that this was someone involved in some type of alchemy. You have someone on the, on the bottom here, uh, Stuart in the middle, Mason, the middle one with three, three faces. In fact, for the family name Mason, it says three Moors heads conjoined on one neck. And if one is wondering about the connection between Mason and Moore, you should continue to wonder because there is a connection. Halliburton on the end, who was the Moor with the helmet. This is Johannes Morris, who was one of the rulers of Sicily. Johannes Morris, one of the rulers of Sicily, 12th century. 12th century. The Moors were in Sicily until 957 and in Crete until about 1026. So when people start you know, recognizing, you see, you know, some people who are Italian walking around and unless they open their mouth and told you they were Italian, you would say, well, you look just like, you know, my uncle or my, my brother, you know because of the Moorish presence. And not even just the Islamic era Moors, but even before that time. This is the Zangermeisters I was talking about. Zangermeister, a sing master. Good German family. Good German family whose ancestry is linked to a Moorish teacher of music who came to Berlin the end of the 16th century and taught music and he married a German woman and the family then became known as the Zengermeisters or the Singmasters. And what again is interesting is when I got this information I went to the Lehigh County Historical Society to find any information of you know, family histories and so forth. These were things that good German Americans were collecting and had, you know, in their own family. 
So again, these are people who say, well, I recognize who y'all are, even if you don't recognize who you are. See, and we need to, rec we need to realize that, uh, again, a lot of us, unfortunately, won't move until the European says move. That's why I say I like to hit him in the bloodline, because the point I'm making is, when we illustrate that the European academics and Europeans who are informed know your legacy, then some of us really start, you know what, I think maybe he's right. Because I heard him say it. I heard that heard this European American make it. So I just lay it out. You know? This is Edouard Charlemagne's famous painting. He was an Austrian painter. Went to Morocco in the 1870s and painted a Moorish chief standing in his abode, in his home. This is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It's a very uh, noble picture, very uh, captivating, in fact, when you go in and see it in the gallery. Again, the point of this is, and now I'll say a little bit about this issue of obfuscating the legacy of the Moors. If you go to most dictionaries and look up the word Moor, or if you go to someone who was a uh, historian, not necessarily the Moors, but a historian knows a little something about that, that uh, imaginary continent called the Middle East, which doesn't exist. There's a continent called Africa and Asia. There is no Middle East. Egypt is not in the Middle East. Egypt is in Africa. And the same is true for Morocco, Algiers, Libya, Tunis. So when we recognize again, you know, how the game is played, this play, the semantic game, we're going to create illusory terms that have no meaning. But if we get you to buy them, then hey, it worked. But when you go to the dictionary and you look up the term more, usually it says somebody who was Berber or Arab. Or it may say uh, the Berber Arab peoples who once occupied Spain. So they limit the, the folks to Spain and they, they call them the Berber or Arab. Well, when you look up the term Berber, it refers to a language group, not an ethnic group. And as a close friend of mine, Aziz Latfi, who was a Moroccan, uh, who was here at, in school, I say here in the States, a temple, and a linguist, he said, brother, you know, no people in Morocco call themselves Berbers if they are speaking the language of their own people. And even the ones that have gotten Western education tend to back off of Berber because they know that it's a reference to a language group. They identify themselves by their ethnic designations. So whether you're talking about somebody saying that they are uh, Sanheja or maybe even Haratin or Azenega, they're pointing out, this is the, the or Kashal, these are the groups that I'm a part of. I'm the Berber, I don't know what you're talking about. But to use that term is designed to create the illusion that Berbers don't have a connection to other African peoples. Because as, as Jilk pointed out in his, in his text, like the African origin of civilization. Europeans introduced terms like Kafir. This group over here is Kafir, and that group is Hamitic, and that group is Semitic, and this group is Negroid, and that group is, is Hottentot. All kinds of terms to separate, to divide and conquer. And essentially, Berber, as it's used, has become used to refer to someone who is a light-complexioned African, who is probably more European in origin, because that was one of the contentions that anthropologists tried to make in order to claim the Moorish Empire. These were light, these are uh, uh, basically, you know, swarthy skinned Europeans. They weren't Africans. And of course, they also had to then make Ill illusory or imaginary distinctions between such such people. So even though somebody was part of the same family, everybody in this village 
All of us here are Sanhedja. That's what we call ourselves. European anthropologist comes in and says, well, I see among you there are some Negroes. So now you, I, I don't see no Negroes. I see uh, Mahmoud and I see Fatima and I, I don't see, what are you talking about? But the idea was to start separating people up on the basis of complexion in order to give the illusion of their own uh, false superiority in numbers. Okay? This is, kind, you know, this is deep. If you think about it, what's the benefit of having a particular uh, group go around the world, dividing everybody up into all little components and compartments, when just a couple of, of years ago or centuries ago, say, y'all niggas, I, what are you talking about? Whether you're from India or whether you're from the Polynesian Islands or Africa, you're all the same people. But you only do that when you're in a position of military superiority, when you can hold on to that. But then later on, when you start to realize, you know, things are changing, we, gotta, we have to make this game a little bit more complex. So they start creating these illusions called races. And these illusions of so-called races of African peoples. On the left is someone who is Moorish by virtue of his name, his origin, but he is a Christian Moor. And he is a Christian Moor by the name of Saint Maurice or Saint Moritz in German. Saint Moritz was the patron saint of the Holy Roman Empire. So for all of us who came through any type of Catholic uh, background, and no, no one's talking about Saint Moritz or Saint Benedict the Moor. Or you know, if they talked about it, mention them, but they don't go into any details. Oh yeah, the name of this church is, you know, Saint Benedict the Moor. Okay. I'm trying, sister, I'm trying. So Saint Maurice, and this is interesting, his origins, his origins are actually in Egypt. Now, this is where we get into understanding this, this link. And I don't know if I get a chance to go over it all uh, tonight, but this link basically between East Africa and West Africa that Gyok essentially laid out, and laid out so well. When he says, you know, don't forget, because folks in West Africa doesn't mean that they have no connection to people in East Africa. When I would get into debates or discussions with Egyptologists, European Egyptologists who would tell me, you know, I'm sick of hearing black Americans, I'm using their terms again, I'm sick of hearing black Americans talking about their links to the Egyptians. They came from West Africa. There's no connection. And I said, well, what do you know about the history of, of you know, migration from East Africa to West Africa? Well, uh, I just know. I said, you, you, what do you know? And then usually they don't know anything. They're just, they're, oh, well, see, that's how you, people say you checkmate them. Because they don't expect you to come with a question that compels them typically to think, well, wait a minute now, I, this, this nigger knows more than I thought. And that's literally the expression. You're like, oh, my God. Well, uh, I'm Austrian and there's uh, no connection to the Germans. Uh, we uh, invented strudel and they didn't. You know, you think I'm kidding, but that's, that's what somebody said to me. That was where they went. They were just, just flustered. Uh, well, you, the Austrians uh, uh, lost the respect that they should have gotten to the Germans. And I'm going, no, wait a minute. Uh, are the Germans and the Austrians both Europeans? Yes. yes. Okay, well, what I'm saying is, you are trying to argue that there's no correlation. I said, I'm not even going to get into the, to the, to the, uh, the fact of the migration from East to West. Let me just look at it this way. East Africa contains African people. Egypt, which was much bigger at one time, which encompassed what we would call the Sudan 
and areas of Chad in the, in the eastern part of Africa. Egypt is right next to, and always been right next to, Ethiopia. Which you, and Nubia, which you keep saying, there's this distinction between Nubia and Ethiopia, I mean, I mean in Egypt, and everybody knows the Nubians and the Egyptians were fighting each other. I said, because they fought each other, didn't mean they were related. I mean, that they weren't related. So you're trying to, you're trying to take this issue of conflict and make it racial. We can disagree. I can disagree with my brother, but it doesn't mean my brother's no longer related to me. So when we consider that, I, just, I had to say a little bit about, about that issue with Egypt because again, there is this, this attempt, like I say, to obfuscate the legacy, to confuse the, the legacy of African people. Saint Maurice was an Egyptian soldier who was part of the Roman Legion around the second century of the Common Era. And what he did was that when he was uh, part of this legion and went into uh, what's now Switzerland and areas of Germany. He came across Germanic and Swiss peoples who had evidently come into contact with the Black Madonna, as it's called. And when he saw this and he was instructed to basically, you know, move these people who were, no who were known as the Swabians, the Swabians or the Suebi, he said, I, I can't do that because these people are worshiping something. That's my stuff over there. And the Roman general told him, no, look, this is how it's done. You either eliminate this group or I eliminate you. And he refused. And so he was martyred. He was killed. And every tenth man in his unit was killed. So he was martyred essentially for refusing to kill Germans, this Germanic tribe. As a consequence, of course, they canonized him. They made him a saint. They made him a saint. Now, again, you know, these are things that don't tend to make it into the classroom in this country. And of course, it's by design. Knowledge is power. And as, as Dr. Karanga would say, we know ourselves by what we have done and do. If we are thinking that we've done nothing, we are nothing. And only humans make history. So if you have no history, you are not human. And essentially, the system operates from that position, and we know why. Let me just also say this, and I'll come back to this. We live in a republic, right? And you know, in a republic, if you look at the Roman Republic, there were three levels in the, in the system. There were citizens, slaves, and aliens. The question is, which are you within that structure? And that's determined by how much you know. That's determined by how much you know about yourself and about how much you know about the system. That's just another representation of St. Maurice, the St. Moritz. This is another indication of a Moorish or African presence, if you will, within England. Part of the Norman, when you talk about the Normans invading England, among the Normans in the 11th century were African peoples, African knights. So much of the Western world's history is directly linked to African people. And of course, you know, if we think about this, given the fact that much of the history has been written by Europeans and from their perspective, many times we're given the terms Negro, Black, or maybe even color, but certainly Negro and Black. If we are trying to do research, we go to a history text and we look at, we go to the index and look up Negro and Black and find out what we did. And in the, in the pursuit of the knowledge of your past, you're going past Carthaginian, Moor, Egyptian, Phoenician. Because of, oh, there are Negroes. I'm looking for Negroes. Where are the Negroes in this book? Because we've been conditioned to think that that Negroes. I'm looking for Negroes. Where are the Negroes in this book?
because we've been conditioned to think that that's what we are. So as a result, we very often can't even find a knowledge of ourselves because we're using the wrong term to pursue it. That's why this is so important. This is from a German Bible of the 13th century, and that's the Queen of Sheba. We need, again I say, to make, make sure we understand, like I say, the European historical record was clear on indicating the legacy of African, if you will, and Moorish people within its own cultural development. And when you go back and look at some of these, these early texts, you see evidence of that. But of course the rise of the enslavement system required the need to hide the history or as I say, to alter or obfuscate it. You may have seen Charlotte Sophia von Mecklenburg. Well, Charlotte Sophia von Mecklenburg was the consort or the queen of England, the wife of King George II. And she was directly descendant of a Moorish woman who was of royal ancestry because Europeans were intermarrying, it shouldn't be surprising, Europeans were intermarrying with Moors and Africans, other African peoples. And we need to also understand that England, as early as the 16th century, established a relationship with the Moorish Empire through something called the Barbary Company, which is a trading company. And this trading company was providing England primarily with agricultural products that it needed, foodstuffs. And that relationship would go on for centuries. And sometimes it would be good, and sometimes it would be bad, depending on what was happening politically. That's Alexandro de Medici. The Medicis, somebody say it looks like Arthur Ashe. <laughs> Alexandro de Medici was the son of a pope. Seems to be a contradiction, right? I know popes were supposed to have sons. It's something about celibacy, I heard. But it was an, an immaculate conception. But Alexandro de Medici was the son of a pope and a Moorish or quote unquote Negro servant. And the Medicis were the ones responsible for the classical Greek Renaissance that takes place in Europe. They're the patrons of learning. They're the ones that provide uh, so much you know, financial and uh, political support. Here is a Moroccan sisters from a postcard. She's got her baby on her back. This is a Moroccan sister also, who was referred to as a Berber. Okay, now let me go back to what I was talking about before. She's a Berber. Okay. She's customarily what Western historians, when they talk about the Moorish legacy and influence, want you to focus in on. All the Moors descended from people who look like her. That's the illusion that people are trying to present. All more, the Moors were lighter in hue. I just showed you all these other coats of arms, this information showing the Moors were of all complexions, but originally they were certainly quite dark in hue. So we're talking about shifting that paradigm, that image, to a lighter complexion person just to feel comfortable again with themselves. Because, you know, we're a little bit closely related to her than we are to these Africans who are darker in complexion, these Moors who are darker in complexion. It makes me feel more comfortable, like maybe there's more of us. <laughs> well, at the same time, now she's a Berber, okay, from this Moroccan tour book that I got this from. This sister is also referred to as a Berber. They're both Berbers. They're both Berbers. Right? This is also a group of Berbers. 
Look at the range. Now again, as Leo Africanus, also known as Azayati, said in the 16th century to the European world when he wrote his, his book about the, the history of Africa, he said, you know, the people in this part of the world are properly called Moors. That's what they res respond to when they come into the Western world. Now keep in mind, because of the contacts going on back and forth between the northwest portion, the western part of Africa, and Europe, if a Moorish person, or someone coming from within those boundaries, goes into the European world as a, world as a, tr as a trader, trading, or as a business person, or, or uh, maybe even in war, as a, as a part of an of a, uh, army, if they learn the language, they're going to use language that the people in that area will respond to. And they're going to use a term which they know that the people in that area are going to recognize. If you saw someone who looked Japanese walking up the street and you said, well, are you Japanese? And I said, no, I'm uh, Shiyoti. I said, what? Uh, oh, Shiyoki. Shiyoki, what? what is That's the name of the clan that I'm from. Well, where's the clan? It's in a village just outside of uh, uh, Toyotora. Well, where's Toyotora? Well, that's, it's, it's, it's in Japan. Oh, it's in Nippon. Well, Nippon, Nippon, where's Nippon? I don't know, it's, it's, it's j what, what are, and they point, oh, Japan, oh, I know what you're talking about. In other words, the Moors, the term Moor, was recognized as a general reference for anyone within the countries of North and West Africa as far south as about the Niger River. And then in the area below the Niger River, that was not seen as being a part and parcel of the Moorish Empire, at least under uh, Al-Mansur in the 16th century and other rulers who came afterwards. So when people from that region went into the Western world were speaking English, they would say, I'm Moorish. If they were speaking Spanish, say, I'm Moros. If they were in France, they might say, I'm Muir. So what we need to understand is that the term was a general reference from anyone within that region. Just like we used to talk about Britain, right? Great Britain. Britain is made up of Scotsmen, Irishmen, Welshmen, and Englishmen. Someone, if they want, can reject being under British domination and say, I'm Irish and I want to have nothing to do with no London or the British. They can do that. But of course, the central government would say otherwise. No, look, whether you like it or not, you're under our authority. That's essentially what begins to happen also within the Moorish Empire. The fragmentation, the internecine conflicts that ensue. But it was understood by Europeans that people from that entire region could properly identify themselves as Moors in general and then be more specific if they wanted. Could somebody be Wolof and Moorish at the same time? Yes. Could somebody be, um, as I mentioned before, Sanheja and Moorish at the same time? Yes. It's a brother sitting in front of a shop. This is also from Morocco. This is a copy of a 14th, no, excuse me, 15th century text on medical surgery and the type of instruments that were to be used. Now, as I mentioned already, the Moorish presence within Europe results in the change of the whole structure the establishment of universities at places like Toledo and Salamanca and Cordova and Granada and outside of Spain I mentioned places like the University of Naples whose curriculum and whose very founding was for the purpose of teaching Moorish medical knowledge that was its function that's why the school was founded Oxford University in the 13th century had a teacher by the name of Adam de Marisco. You know, on the faculty registry for Oxford, 
and you don't know what de Marisco means. You know, there's an Englishman teaching at the Oh, It is a strange name. But his name means Adam of the Moors. And it would not be unusual, of course, to find him teaching mathematics or astronomy in the 13th century. As I mentioned earlier, I think it was on the, the radio today, I talked about Al-Adrisi, a Moor from Suta, coastal city in, in northwest Africa, who in 1154 produced a silver globe and a companion text showing the important zones of the world for trade. The purpose of this was so that merchants in places like Venice and Genoa could use it to go out and establish trading partners. Now, Aladrisi, a Moor, was commissioned by Roger II, who was at the time the ruler of Sicily, to produce this globe and this companion text. Now, for this sphere, this globe to be produced in 1154, proves what? that the world was round, right? That obviously the Moors knew the world was a sphere, but of course we're led to believe, you know, typically, you know, the, right, Christopher Columbus, you know, and he said, I'm going to prove that the world is not flat. You know, all you had to do was go and talk to some, some one of the Moors who was still living outside of Donata, he would have told you the world wasn't, wasn't flat. And I also submit Columbus knew where he was going. I don't think Columbus was lost, okay? That's something else I'll, I'll try to get into in a moment. But this surgical text, not only did it show you the, how to conduct the procedure, but it showed you what instruments to use and even how to make the instruments. So the Moors are producing medical texts would show you point by point how to make the instruments to conduct the surgery. And then these texts would be translated by people like Alfonso X and others, but he was the one who really turned it into an industry. I'm bringing all these Catholics here, I'm bringing all these Moors who are willing to teach here to Toledo to translate these texts and to write them out in hand in different vernaculars and send them throughout the kingdom. So you're talking about some serious instruction. Okay? And it's only after the Moorish presence that the medieval universities of the Western world begin to establish themselves. That's no accident. That's no accident. It's not coincidence. This is just the uh, and I just want to give an example, of course, I'm sure most of you have seen examples of, of Moresque architecture. Some people say Arabesque. This is from a palace in Morocco, uh, Tetuan. Now I'm going to change gears on you a minute. Most of us think that the legacy of African people in the Americas begins with slave ships arriving on these shores and bringing African people. That's what most people in the United States think. While it is true that there is evidence showing that many Africans were indeed captured off the coast of West Africa, places like uh, Gore Island, and brought to the West Indies, and brought to the Americas. It is also true that many Africoid peoples were already here. Now we've had people like Ivan Van Sertimum who've talked about this and they came before Columbus and then in his edited work, um, The African Presence in Early America. But before him, before Brother Van Sertima, 
There were Europeans who were saying the same thing, like Leo Weiner or Weiner, and people like John McIntosh, who was, was writing in the middle of the 19th century, the Indians of North America, and basically pointed out, these people are related to Africans. These people are related to Ethiopians. Now, Alexander von Wolfenau, who was the German art historian, who wrote the book Unexpected Faces in Ancient America. It's basically a pictorial history and a revelation about the African presence in pre-Columbian America. And it's no accident that this information, although it was part of American folklore at one time, is increasingly denied and an emphasis is placed upon the idea of African peoples all being brought here on slave ships. Now, this particular artifact or statuette referred to as an old man with hat, this is from Alexander von Wuthenau's book, is from the classic period which is between 300 and 900 of the Common Era. This is from Veracruz in Mexico. Now, I don't know about what you see, but that looks like a brother wearing a fez. So it looks like something wrong. Now, I don't know, I'm just saying, you know, Von Wuthenau makes the same contention that when he looks at some of these these uh, statuettes, these artifacts. He says they speak for themselves. And he talks about how a man who was at the Smithsonian named Dr. Alex Herdlika, who was in charge of the ethnography department, did everything he could to hide those statuettes, those artifacts, which showed African features, or Africoid features and how he ensured that you would not get a job as an ethnographer, not only at the Smithsonian Institute, but at any legitimate, quote-unquote, uh, ethnographical institution, anthropological institution in the country, if you challenge that. This is what von Wolfenau talks about. So there was obviously an attempt to hide this information from folks. This second one, all right now. <laughs> See, brother said it looks like Joe Frazier. This kneeling figure, now why he's kneeling, I mean, we don't know. Was he working? Was he praying? Was he meditating? Of course, I, you know, I can't get into the mind of the sculptor, the person who put that together, but it sure is interesting when you consider that with all the other information. So you gotta tie everything in together. And this kneeling figure is from the Olmec, and it's from Guatemala. So we're not talking again about people tend to just you know, focus perhaps on Mexico with the old neck heads at Tres Zapotes a la Venta. But this is from Guatemala. And it actually is from 600 BCE. This early Negroid, as Van Wuthenau put it, and I, you know, I will forgive him on this because he's, he's produced so much information, assistance, but this early Negroid representation from Morelos, Mexico. Again, this is from the Archaic Era. And Archaic, when they just dated as Archaic, this is some time between 2000 BCE and 100 BCE, we don't know, but it's old. And this is from 
is from, as I already said, it's from Mexico. This vessel, this vessel is from the post-classic period, which is between 900 and 1500 of the Common Era. And this is from Costa Rica. And again, we see this evidence of African peoples and the Africoid features throughout Central and South America. This is also from the Olmec era, from uh, Tres Zapotes. As is this. And this is also, this, this is from, uh, well you can see it actually in Ivan Van Sertum as they came before Columbus, as well as in um, Van Wuthenau's text. And I like what he did in comparing the chief the Nuba chief with the features of this, this Olmec monument. And those things stand between seven and nine feet tall. And some, in fact, are actually larger. It's another. These are all right here in the Americas and all predate Columbus. This is an in a, in Arapaho Indian brother. And this, again, is something that should cause us to pause. When you read references uh, like Hernan Lopez de Castaneda, who wrote a book in the 15th century in which he referred to the peoples living in Panama as part of an Ethiopian tribe, which means that they must have looked like African people. And this was essentially what Europeans met when they arrived. When you see references to the Arawak and the Carib Indians who are thought to be, as the Europeans used to say, Mohammedans because of their attire and their customs. And when Columbus's own son refers to these things, it should compel you to pause and, and ask, were we already here before the Europeans arrived? When you consider the fact that when Columbus himself met what he called the King of Cuba, he began to speak, or his translators began to speak immediately with these people. Now, on board the ship were people that spoke Arabic, Chaldean, and Hebrew. Now, for them to start conversing right away seems kind of peculiar, unless the languages were either one of those three, or were at least Semitic, as we would say. And fought together, intermarried, etc. But I submit, when you consider the evidence, maybe those people who fled had already been there. If you consider the term Indian now, and let me just, this is something again to, to help you perhaps understand how to reinterpret the term Indian when you go and do some research on your own, which I hope you'll, you'll do. At one time, the Europeans used the term Indian or Indias to refer to African people. Now, a lot of folks didn't even know that. It's like, really? Oh, yes. Absolutely. And when people in the early 19th century were reading a book called a, a Sketch of an African Indian, 1822 by Salop 
Wellington, and you look at the image, they even give you, you know, uh, uh, pictures. A sketch of an African Indian. They're talking about people from Gambia. The book is about a Gambian, but he's called an African Indian. Given that, what does that make us think when you go back and imagine when Europeans talked about Indians in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries? How did those people look? We assume that they would have looked like the dime store, uh, the cigar store, or dime store Indian. You know, you have to be reddish brown in complexion with straight black hair, an aquiline nose, right? Well, that is, is a legitimate phenotype of an Indian. But when you go back and you read court cases of Indians like the Narragansetts, who lived up in, in Rhode Island, and you hear people testifying to Narragansetts, as, as long as we knew, were always very curly and uh, had very curly hair and dark complexions. You can hardly tell them from the so-called Negroes. So when people reveal something like that, they're saying, wait a minute, you might want to reconsider how, you know, what this term Indian was talking about. Right? Hmm. Okay, I'll leave that up there, and let me say a little bit about the significance of this information as it pertains to the organization known as the Moorish Science Temple. In 1913, a man by the name of Timothy Drew Ali, also known as Noble Drew Ali, began teaching in Newark, New Jersey, that African Americans, who were then calling themselves Negro, Black, and Colored, should more properly see themselves as Moorish Americans, should more properly consider themselves as already having been in the Americas as well as linked to the African continent. His contention, of course, met with a lot of opposition. Because people were saying, well, how can you prove, what do you mean Moors? You know, 1913, how can you prove, what do you know about any Moorish links? Well, two things that we can, can surmise from this. One is, as I tried to make clear already, this term Moorish was recognized as being a reference to, if you will, a phenotypically, meaning of physical features, a phenotypically Africoid people who primarily were known to occupy the regions of North and Northwest Africa. But the truth of the matter is, when you consider this issue of phenotype, you find people in West Africa who look like people in Central Africa and South Africa and East Africa. So we know that there's obviously a, a mixture of peoples. But why would he then say, well, you can actually identify yourself as Moorish? Well, one reason is because, as I pointed out before, evidence suggests, whether it's Abu Bakari II of Mali, an African Muslim who leads an expedition into the Americas, and at that time in the 14th century, the European world would have recognized that particular kingdom as being within the larger Moorish Empire. And if we find evidence, as people like Van Sertum and others have found, of this African Muslim presence, and if you find people like Robert Beverly II, who was one of the early historians of Virginia, writing in the early 1700s, like 1720, 1715, and this man is talking about the Indians of Virginia reminding him of the peoples of Ethiopia, Morocco, and Libya. He likens their food to being similar. William Penn likens the people that he saw in, in uh, Pennsylvania, what becomes Pennsylvania, as looking like the Jewish people of London. And most of those Jewish people just happen to be Sephardic Jews. Most of those 
people had left and had been expelled from, guess where? More Spain. So for him to be making these connections, obviously in the case that these people must have had, I mean, phenotypically, and even talks about their culture, their mannerisms, describes their children. And like, these, these folks remind me of, of uh, the Jews back in London who basically are Moorish, Sephardim, or if you will, African Jews. So all these things are suggesting this, this presence. So for Noble Drew Ali to make that statement in 1913, it was pretty profound considering that most people didn't know about Van Sertima because he wasn't born yet. Most people didn't know about uh, Leo Wiener, even because Leo Wiener didn't write his book until the 1920s. And this was part of, you know, his oral tradition. Drew Ali was telling people that this was the, the case. He referred to the Americas as Northwest Africa and Southwest Africa, at least in the official literature. Which means that while Africa is home, so is America. This, right. So, when so next time somebody says, why don't you go back where you came from? Say, I'm, I'm where I was. <laughs> Certainly more so than you, who just got here. In, in more ways than one. The second thing that's significant as to why Drew Ali was emphasizing the idea of nationality or saying that people were Moorish is because he obviously recognized that the legal history of the United States revealed that one had to be a recognized national to be seen as a person and not as a condition and the Constitution was designed to protect persons, not conditions. So if one was calling themselves black 200 years ago, it was recognized, like the term Negro, that those terms referred to someone's condition and not to their nationality, because we know there is no Negro land or a black land. If we go back also to the 18th century and consider what did some of the more progressive institutions in the United States refer to themselves as? You had the Free African Society. You had the Free African Schools. You had the African Methodist Episcopal Church. You even had the African Baptist, First African Baptist Church. People recognized in the 18th century that it's important to identify myself as an African because African is a rec at least, it may not be specific in terms of identifying a nation, but at least is recognizing my personhood. Because an African is a person. A black is a condition. In fact, the laws of the time, you can go back and read court cases where um, judges said, you know, a black is not the same thing as a person of color. Now what did they mean by it? They said a black is not the same thing as a person of color. But one thing is the letter of the law. Think like lawyers, and I know Brother Maddox appreciate this. Europeans are sticklers for the letter of the law. Lynn Dumanile, who was a historian who wrote a book, Harvard University Press, about the history of, of Freemasonry talks about this Freemasonic tradition among Europeans which emphasizes the letter of the law. You gotta do it just right. You gotta follow the law. There's a system, there's a pattern, it's logical. You gotta, you know, nothing is by accident. And when you consider the idea of, you know, free and accepted, 
right? Free and accepted. When you see that, you know, was it uh, AF, uh, A and M? Are you free? Well, how do you? Decide? I'm free. There's no slavery, right? Well, I don't know. That's debatable. I think this is whether it's slavery or not. But what designates a person legally? Because keep in mind, this whole country had a tradition of denying the personhood of people, as peculiar as that sounds. But they were saying, you know, a bl if you are a black, you're not a person. And why would, for example, after Europeans who were leading the, the uh, was led by Andrew Jackson, after they defeated the Seminole and African peoples, they thought it was necessary. Now listen now. They thought it was necessary to legally redefine the people as Negroes. Why? Just enslave them. What you get? Well, now you're officially known as Negroes, and I'm putting it in the register as Negro. Who cares? You're oppressing us anyway. But what's the function of legal? I got it legally now. Boom. This is what you are. Why would the Catholic Church, during the days of the Inquisition, Say, you Moors, who are now under our jurisdiction, you ain't Moors anymore. You're now, we'll start out small, you're Moriscos, you're little Moors. And, well, let me go one better. We're breaking you in, we're making you fit within the framework of this new Catholic kingdom known as Spain. You're now Mudejars which means the broken or tamed ones. And this is official. So when, you know, I put it in the registry. Like I said, I got, I'm just, just calling you that. Put it in the registry. So-and-so is a morisco. Then we go one better. You're neither of those things. Now you are negros. You are black things. You are parcel. You are parcel. Why is there a tradition in parts of the Spanish-speaking world, like in Cuba, where people historically would answer to the term of Moreno and Morena, which is a reference to Moors. The term Moor is in it. Your personhood, your brown, a brown sister, Morena. Brown brother, Moreno. Historically, if somebody called you a Negro, they were trying to piss you off. Because it was understood that you were they were essentially calling you a slave. And when you look at the record, why would Native American peoples fight so hard to avoid from being defined as Negroes? So, no, I'm not, I'm Cherokee. I'm Choctaw. Don't link me to that name because I know that this government create has a system, that's his system that says, once you label me as that, I'm a non-person. And I don't have the same rights as other folks. There's a community in South Carolina known as the Turks, also known and were first known as the Moors. The Ben and Holly family. This family, which is in Sumter County, which now, I mean, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the most of the Ben and Hallies, you know, these are poor folks. You know, these are people who are struggling to survive. But historically, they were once recognized a, as being of African ancestry, being Moors, and B, being white, and being citizens. That seems like a contradiction. How can you be African and white at the same time? Well, you could be 200 plus years ago. And you could even shortly after that time. Because white was understood to refer to your caste, your class. And whites were only people who were recognized nationals, right? Think about it. A white was a recognized national. Irish, English, German, Spanish, Italian. If you had a nation and you carried the accoutrements of that nation, whether it be your name, your custom, your language, that's who you were. So it was understood that these folks are white because they're linked to a nation. But black was used to refer to someone whose condition was that of servitude. 
So what was the brother trying to say? He was trying to say that if one identifies with these terms, they're giving Europeans a legal excuse to treat folks as outcasts or as aliens or as slaves in a republic which has citizens, slaves, and aliens. Now you may say, well, what difference does that make? You know, the European do what he wants to do anyway. You might be correct on that. But again, I submit, if we accept the premise that there are some Europeans who are in positions of authority who are actually afraid of universal and spiritual law, because they know if they don't do something right, it's going to kick them in the, in the, the, the ass. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I said it anyway. Right? So kick them in the tuckers. We recognize, right, that if there are some who do, they got to be careful how they oppress you. All right? The Knights Templar, one of the divisions within, within the Freemasonic tradition, the Knights Templar historically were a group of Catholic priest knights who were responsible for having extensive contacts and making treaties with the Moors in the medieval period. That's the origin of the Knights Templar. And eventually, because their theology began to, to look more and more like Islam, okay, they were start, sort of, well, you know, Jesus is a divine, you know, agent of God. I'm not really sure. Because of these constant debates going on between whenever they go over to the Moors, because they were the ones that were trying to make trees, they, you know, so you had to have some type of, uh, what do they call it, a truce? in the process, you know, transition going on. And secondly, because of that, they became a threat to the Catholic Church, who saw to say, these people might actually take over. Okay? So what did they do? They killed the Knights Templar. They, they outlawed them. They went after them. But yet it's now recognized as a division or, or an element within the Freemasonic tradition. What I'm essentially saying is that Europeans have had cons quite a bit of contact with the African Muslim world, the Moorish world, Moorish culture. And they did adhere to many of the principles. But because, and I won't get into the, the reasons, because you've heard several, I'm sure, from, you know, Cress Welsing, Dr. Cress Welsing, to just issues of environment, you know, issues of environmental uh, conditioning, they couldn't really stay right. So they looked for the loopholes so I, wanna, I still want to oppress, but I got to do it carefully because I know that if I don't, something may come back on me. So again, this issue of having to declare oneself properly within the, within the government, within the nation, evidently was seen by uh, Brother Prophet Noble Drew Ali as something significant, something that would be a benefit. That he evidently thought that it would help and certainly wouldn't hurt people known as colored black and negro. Now if we look at another issue of that era and then I'll, I think maybe I'll stop because I, I don't want to hold people here too long. If we consider how many African nationals, including at my own institution, West Virginia University did not allow so-called Negro Americans to attend the institution. But it did allow Africans who had nationalities, who at the time were under colonialism in the 30s, but were still identifying themselves as Yoruba, Africans, from what would later become Nigeria. And so they were covered as nationals under the, under the British, right? Because the British said, you're a British what? Subject. And a subject is a person. Letter of the law. Why would Booker T. Washington, writing in Up From Slavery in the early uh, 1900s, talk about his trip to Washington, D.C., in which he saw a man who was evidently being yelled at by someone in a hotel, telling me, we don't allow Negroes in here. Get out. Get out. This is not a colored hotel. And the man said, I'm, I'm Moroccan. I'm Moroccan. And they said, oh, I'm, oh we're sorry. Come on in. Right, regardless of what he looked like. 1786 treaty with the United States, between U.S. and Morocco, specifically identifies Moors 
specifically. And it says that those persons who are Moors are essentially to be recognized as citizens. Why? Why then, right, would you have a petition January 20th, 1790? It's in the South Carolina House of Representatives. Why would you have a peti petition in which, as it says, a group of free and sundry Moors desires to be recognized as subjects of an emperor in alliance with this government and not to be classified under the Negro Act. Now, is this an example of people running, you know, you're trying to deny, you're trying to deny who you are? Oh no, on the contrary, they were establishing who they were. And essentially what you have occurring is people in that situation trying to constantly reinforce the fact that they are Moors and that this treaty was established in 1786 and it'll be re it would, would be um, renewed after 50 years and it'll be renewed after another 50 years and then it later became perpetual and it's still in effect today. Now why would they do that? They were obviously trying to eliminate any excuse for the European government, well, for this government, to treat them as either outcasts, alien slaves, and give them certain rights under a granted privilege, but not in accordance with the law of the land, which is the US Constitution. So the rationale, clearly for what Drew Ali was doing, was to deny the government an excuse to treat people like outcasts. And there is historical evidence indicating that it was valid, that he had a valid point. So what I'll do, I think now, is I'll stop. Uh, if I missed anything, you, I mean, excuse me, I am extremely tired anyway. And uh, both, it's been a long night, but that's right. So I'll stop. Let's get